All right. Good evening, everybody. Uh, I think we're all set up on Zoom. And thank you for everybody that's here. We're going to go ahead and get started. Um, so again, I want to thank all of you for being here in person and taking time out of your day. Um, I would like to thank Technoglass again for sponsoring the USOA lecture series. Um, I'm really excited about this fall and this spring. Thank you, Dean Al Corey, for the continued support for the lecture series and for the ability to bring the diverse voices to our architecture community. Um, it's it's really great uh, to be able to hear about the different perspectives and and the work um, from around the country and around the world. This evening is a special night as our faculty, Professor Vascones and her Otima Lab help sponsor the guests for being here. With this shared sponsorship, we are able to offer a workshop for the students on Paris urbanism and typologies. Very exciting. Several of the students um, are signed up. If you haven't heard about it and you're interested, please email myself or Professor Vascones. And with that, I would like to introduce Gabriela Gama and Philippe Lorenco. Gabrielle and Philippe are architects, co-founders, and design partners at Apparatus Architects. Founded in 2016, the office is an award-winning international architecture and design practice with offices in Lisbon and Portugal. This evening, they will share their ideas on architecture and the in-betweens that refer to the delicate moments between a project's conception and materialization, where the architect is at a critical point of either creating a meaningful legacy or accepting the fate of being archived. We talked about this in professional practice today. Projects die. We all have to deal with it. But what do we do when that happens? Hopefully, they're going to help us through that. Gabriella and Philippe will share four projects caught in this current state of limbo and exploring internal actor, or sorry, external actors beyond its traditional boundaries. In their work, they explore the use of typology as a method of reasoning and experimenting through type in architecture and urbanism. I've had the pleasure of spending um, a few conversations with Philippe and Gabriella, and I'm very excited um, that they're here again, offering their voices and their knowledge to our architecture community. I'm really looking forward to the workshop, which will start Friday. Um, tomorrow evening, they're also going to give a lecture at Bake House, uh, which is in Woodwood Norte. So I'm really excited to welcome them. Please help me in welcoming Gabriella and Philippe. Thank you, Shauna. <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay, so we are so honored to have been invited to the 2023 Technoglass Lecture Series to talk about our work. It is a truly humbling experience to be a part of this panel among so many architects and colleagues whom we deeply admire. We would like to express our gratitude to the School of Architecture, the faculty, Dean Rodolphe El Curi, Professor Zeruska Vascones and Shauna Meyer for extending this invitation to us. We would also like to thank all the students for coming this evening and for enrolling in the workshop in which will happen this weekend and for which we are very excited about. Today, we will share our working process with you with the aim of contributing to the con discussion on what it means to have an architectural practice in the present time. Our intention is to stimulate meaningful debate or at the very least engage a fruitful conversation. Um, founded in uh, 2016, Apparatus Architect is an award-winning uh, international architecture design office with offices in Brasilia and Lisbon. We offer a wide range of services in architecture, urban planning, graphic design, interior design, and object design. In 2020, we were honored with the prestigious Architizer a a Awards, recognizing the studio as one of the most innovative industry leaders and in emerging talents. Our team consists of skilled architects and designers from diverse backgrounds, fostering a unique environment for creative collaboration. We specialize in architecture, adaptive reuse of an urban design, working on projects of various scales and typologies. Sustainability and accessibility are integral to our approach, and we actively explore and, impl and implement local, social, and natural strategies to generate ecological impact. 
As a research-driven office, we integrate architectural thinking into the core of our practice. Research is an essential part of our work. Making our investigation relevant is intrinsic to our conceptual process. Working on a global scale in different countries provide us with valuable cultural and socioeconomic insights, as well as a unique opportunities for collaborations. These principles, along with their ever, with our ever evolving practice, uh, found the very, uh, form the very foundation of Apparatus Architects. Here are a few projects that we developed over the years, which show a bit of our range, uh, the range of our work. Um, this is a collective housing project of uh, two existing um, Art Deco buildings in Lisbon. This is a Godini Castle. It's a 17th century castle in France, which was purposely uh, transformed into a residential project. This is uh, the MAG Museum. It is uh, a, a museum of sustainability in Porto. It was a competition uh, proposal that we made uh, for this museum in Porto, Portugal. This is a, a neighborhood um, and a social housing project, um, also a competition in Lisbon. This is a private, uh, a private home. It's a housing project of a prefab housing project in Cascais, uh, Portugal. This is uh, another example of a prefab uh, structure. It's a coffee pavilion, um, a coffee pavilion uh, in Brasilia, Brazil. This is uh, another range now going into interior architecture. Um, we did this uh, interior architecture and design project in Paris. It's a restaurant. And uh, just to show that we also have uh, the inter, this is a, an example of an interior architecture project that we did in Lisbon as well. Um, in between. In architecture in between refers to the delicate moment where between a project's conception and its materialization, where the architect is a critical point, either creating a meaningful legacy or accepting the fate of never uh, of being archived. This lecture will discuss three projects caught in this current state of limbo, the state of either wanting to be built, expect to have the chance to be built or never seeing the light of day. Architecture trans transcends mere construction science. It should be understood as a multifaceted discipline, encompassing, um, encompassing intri intricate diagrams that interweave and converse with external factors beyond its traditional boundaries. It is a quest to understand the problematic of scales, them being various diagrams and pressures which shape the architecture and the urban landscape, such as the political, the social, the economic, and the territorial scales. The selected projects will be used as a starting point to delve into the vulnerabilities and the, in the inquiries about the conceptual process, a comprehensive walkthrough, the use of typology as a method of reasoning and experimenting through type in architecture and urbanism. These three diagrams represent one, each one a project. Through their typologies, we will present three projects tonight two of which are social housing in Sao Paulo, Brazil. And the third one is the Health School of, high, of Higher Education of the Red Cross Portugal, located in Lisbon, Portugal. <clears throat> so the first project is in uh, La Pena, which is a neighborhood not far away from the center of Sao Paulo. Sao Paulo is actually the largest metropolis of South America, but since 2000, actually 400 people, 400,000 people left the city center due to, well, the high cost, the high cost of housing, which means that this uh, desertification of the center has contributed um, to be invited, invaded by homeless people, drugs and prostitution. And the, the area is known as the Cracolandia, the land of crack. Here is just to understand that when we're talking about the city of Sao Paulo, we need to understand, well, let's say three scales, the center of Sao Paulo, Sao Paulo as a city, and then the large metropolitan area. Just for you to see as a comparison, the city of Sao Paulo is two times bigger than Manhattan and 14 times bigger than Paris. What is really interesting uh, in, in this conflict that we want to talk about is that, as an example, 7 million middle-class residents in Sao Paulo 5 million live in the periphery, which means that 75% of the jobs are located in the city center, while 78% of the population is living in the metropolitan area. And the first question when you look for a job in Sao Paulo is, where do you live, actually, to know if, well, you manage to come uh, to the city? And 
10% of the richest in the city center have nine times higher chance to be to access the job. So um, on average, people spend four hours per day commuting with a minimum of three stops. Uh, our project, Jardin La Peine and San Miguel, both projects, are located 35 kilometers from uh, the center district, which takes approximately one hour and 45 minutes by train, or if you want to, two hours, 13 bicycle, or you can walk for six hours, like we did. Um, what we see actually, uh, when we look to the uh, specific localization of, um, of the plot, is there is two main access to get there. Either way, you go to the highway or you take the railway. Here, you look and you see that the train station will act in a way as a generator of urbanity. It will be the central point where usually uh, urbanity will spread and develop. Uh, both land, each side of the railway, is at seven minute distance work from uh, the train station. What, when we look more specifically inside, what we see is that it, the highway, the railway, they, they work as urban barriers. And we feel after uh, being there and the entire analysis that there is a lack, an absolute lack of public space and community space. And as we said here, uh, the outskirts lack proper urban infrastructure, urban planning, permeability rate, mandatory setbacks, green areas, and basic amenities. The process of exclusion from the city center to the metropolitan area is not solely physical and economic, but also encompass broader dimensions such as social, cultural, and ideological aspects. And, oops, yes, yes, sorry. So when we start looking a bit, uh, um, we do a zoom in into uh, the scenario. What we need to understand is most of this area, okay, there is a quote, a beautiful quote in the newspaper. They say, well, uh, when um, the state is absent, the crime uh, rules, right? So the government's lack of housing policy has allowed, uh, oh, thank you, <laughs> allowed illegal occupation of the territory to flourish over the last 30 years. This trend began with popular and political movement that supported this occupation. However, now the economy of crime has started to compete with this movement. Criminal activities include deforestation, dividing the land into lots and engaging in illegal sales. And obviously, the absence of planning, policies, and basic infrastructure has resulted in precarious living condition for the poorest population. As a result, the city becomes a dormitory area, devoid of culture. This had a tremendous impact on health, safety, and welfare. And here are some pictures when we work through uh, the area we're studying. And as you can, as you can see, uh, for, for us and for me, it was absolutely hard to understand that uh, in Sao Paulo, at, 30 kilometers of the city center, I could find that. Um, and what's more shocking for me is that the infant mortality rate is 20 times higher in the outskirts compared to the city center. And worse than that for me was to understand that if you live in the periphery, you will die 20 years before than people oh, think. Yes. And this is the picture of the open, uh, open air sewage system. So there isn't even the basic infrastructure for sewage. So now, um, as you can see, both the projects will be e are in each side of the, the railway, the mm -hmm. train station. Mm -hmm. And we'll look now deeper in the first in Jardin Lapin and then in San Miguel. So. So um, here, from what we can see, um, there is um, a full occupation and built. Let's say that every plot is almost entirely built. And where it's not built, we have the roads. Um, so there's an absolute lack of uh, any public amenity, like you were saying. So absence of primary infrastructure, such as what sidewalks, water, sewage, and proper transportation, absence of public and collective spaces, lack of cultural and social spaces, um, absence of an urban development plan and urban planning rules. And so I think what we need to what we need to understand here is that there is an absolute lack for any public or communal areas in in this neighborhood this is just an aerial view so you can see how actually built that is it's very very built and here we would go into what the local dominant types are so basically we can only find two of them the plot is the the blue uh sort of rectangle and the collective housing type is um, present on the right and on the left the singular housing type these are uh, the most the, the dominant types of the area 
In When we look at the uh, singular housing type, we can see a few characteristics. First of all, they, it's entirely self-made, so they built it themselves. The materiality is most likely exposed. Uh, you either see the concrete blocks or the ceramic bricks. Um, the insalubrity, uh, there is a lack of uh, proper ventilation because the lots, the plots are entirely built. Uh, the private areas are usually on the upper floor and the garage areas in the bottom is where uh, they make sort of this uh, hybrid between a uh, garage space or uh, other public sort of uh, space that either uh, relates to the community on the outside of this fence or um, it's, a porch for us. it's it's what I think the most equivalent to what you have here as a porch. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, and when we look into the collective housing type, um, we're talking about a set of identical buildings in, that were built in series, enclosed in a fence. Uh, they're usually privately owned and uh, made um, to be sold. So we're talking about uh, something that is that is not made, uh, let's say, self-built as they do it. So no relation to the public. And it's plastered and painted. That's the main difference. Yeah, us. they they have, they are usually plastered and painted. So we don't see the materiality of, of the architecture of the of the structure. Right. So um, in that situation, when there is an absence of uh, the state, there is foundations and the Tietz Tubal Foundation is an NGO which has a, a mission to contribute to the sustainable development of peripheral areas in Sao Paulo and address social spatial inequalities. And in that sense, they decide to uh, um, invite uh, officers to think about the possibility of try to change, try to change this idea. And uh, the main goal and the main task of the, uh, the competition was to bring diversity and flexibility on typologies, um, allow, have a celebrity and cross ventilation to make sure that, uh, well, even after COVID, because yeah, this competition was uh, launched in 2022. So it was uh, after COVID and the disaster uh, uh, that's happened everywhere, but also mainly in Brazil. Uh, it should be collective housing and not singular units. Um, it should be a space that where we could work and live, have a porous ground, you know, in order to have a certain, to have retail and business. When I, when we say create worthy housing, is create housing where people will find dignity, and they will feel uh, they will feel comfortable to live in and to take care. Uh, to bring leisure areas, uh, security is uh, at the utmost importance uh, in Brazil and spatial porosity, um, when when they said as a model for the community, they want us because they are self-aware that people will keep doing and doing self-construction, but at least if we could, by using the same materials or the same visual identity or idea they used to, and make that kind of the project will be a model that could be replicated or at least inspired for uh, better construction. And then the last was a semi-public uh, communal space, which is very important for them to bring a uh, communal space that even though if it's it's in the in the, in the building, it could uh, uh, be a space where the outside community could use for activities. So the first problem was in a way to understand and how to bring uh, uh, well public realm into the plot, right? And uh, in order to do so, uh, we use both typo typologies, the central void, serve as the focal point around which the housing was organized. These typologies, the patio and the villa, sorry, um, were self-contained, isolated, and disconnected from the urban public. The central void functioned as an access point, ventilation space, and community area, while also serving as a mean of control and observation. With only access from the street, they limited their connection to the urban context, making them easier to contain and isolate. But really, this typology offers a solution for private sector to the problem of uncontrolled growth in the city. However, although widely used worldwide, this typology were not questioned and challenged enough as a model that could be reproduced, transformed, adapted, and mainly integrated within the urban fabric. Oops. So we're looking, so now we're gonna, yeah, we can start the project. So for the La, La, La Pena plot, the first plot, which is a rectangular plot, uh, we use the patio um, to uh, as a typological uh, solution for for the urban 
uh, realm question of the project. This is the plot. It is 25 meters per 20 meters. Um, the volume, we could only raise 10 meters and then we'd have to have a setback of three meters. Um, so once you have the block, uh, we broke it open to have uh, natural lighting and ventilation. And then um, when we break it open, we start to see the patio. So from here, uh, we set up the units. So you have um, one bedroom, one bedroom unit, two bedroom units and studios with a communal um, room in the back and a um, and commercial, a commercial unit in facing the front the facing the streets. The idea um, of the circulation was to contain absolutely uh, all of the vertical circulation that is the most expensive part, let's say, of uh, building this, the social housing. Uh, we tried to contain it in, into the, the back block and make um, these bridges that would connect both buildings to optimize the circulation and have this sort of uh, this gallery that could in the air. Um, here, uh, the, the roof, uh, one, one of the uh, requests of the program was to uh, have a roof that was to work for gardening on both proposals. So we would propose a, a common area and we'd have um, studios on the top of the building. Um, if, since we're talking about Brazil, we're talking about a very harsh and hard, uh, let's say a very hot climate, which I think you understand here as well. Um, we propose to have bri uh, the Brise Soleil, uh, to really uh, target and cut uh, the sunlight. And what we did with this was we actually incorporated it in the facade. So we uh, have a setback of the windows in the back. And this way we, we can, we don't have, uh, it becomes a part of the facade. Here are the plans of the project. Um, we can see there's the ground floor with the uh, commercial units in the front, the uh, patio that works between both buildings, the front building and the back building, and the vertical course circulation that happened in the building right next to a big communal uh, room, which is something that was also um, they, they asked for, for the community. Um, on here we have a uh, floor type uh, type floor uh, where we can see that the units, the different units, we have a studio, uh, one bedroom and two bedrooms uh, in each floor. And the fourth floor, we only have the studios and the gardening area. This is just the sections, um, section drawings and facades of the building. And go for it. Yeah, you, you might wonder why our patio in a way um, is just one building in front of the other. But the idea was always to uh, understand how this model could be replicated and create a new urban, well, a new communal and public space. And in order to do so, it was very important because I, I think you remember the plots and all this area, these illegal settlements uh, will change over time. So the idea was, uh, um, according to the specific socioeconomic diagrams, to uh, think of a space that, through time, okay, could create a new access. And now Alpatia could generate a communal corridor in which, well, communal and public activities could occur uh, and of different uh, uh, genre. This was, uh, in a way, just a floor plan and the, a small collage to explain uh, our idea and how it will uh, be linked, creating this uh, this movement. We've got uh, uh, volleyball uh, uh, terrain. Uh, uh, kindergarten space for talk, church, etc. So this is an overall uh, view of the building. Um, the color was, in a way, important. Uh, and when we presented uh, that to the community uh, last uh, December uh, in Sao Paulo, we were we were really pleased because, in a way, uh, uh, th th there are this little kid who asked her mom if she could uh, keep the yellow. Uh, flat on the top. And I think the idea of uh, generating uh, a certain identity and appropriation worked really well. You can see here, uh, well, uh, the relationship with the ground floor and the streets and this uh, this access and this passage. passage. Yes. Oh, sorry, no, uh, and the exposed materiality as well. It was really yes. important to keep because it was something that was present there and they might find that it's not, um, architecture enough or they find that it's not uh, pretty enough and this is just showing that with what they use to actually build 
as a finished material is something that could be um, still look very nice. This is the courtyard area, and we also uh, wanted to keep the detail about the of the perforated uh, metal uh, fences um, between the streets and and the interior, like they had in the single single uh, typology, the single housing typology. So, regarding the second plot, San Miguel, the analysis is quite similar because the distance between both is not enormous. We're talking about less than <laughs> one kilometers. But what we find there, uh, the only difference now is that we have, well, a different context where we add warehouses. And uh, in the other side, we had more houses and fences and streets and doors. And here, it was completely different. We were walking, um, well, along walls. Uh, so... The question in San Miguel is much, um, it's much linked to insecurity. So many people to come to La Pena, they also come through San Miguel and they find that it's very insecure because uh, they have less perforated fences, less people uh, who are inside their houses looking out because there are just uh, sort of opaque uh, walls. This is an aerial view. Uh, so you can see that here we have more of the, um, Warehouse typology, longer, bigger typologies, or less built, but uh, larger typologies. So we still have the singular housing as a dominant type and the uh, warehouse. Here we see just the fences. They they really are uncovered. Um, maybe they feel that it's more secure on the inside, and they, they're they not the same as San Miguel. And the uh, industrial type, of the type, uh, which does not, uh, help the insecurity because the industrial type is enclosed to the exterior. It doesn't promote any communal activity and it's monoprogrammatic. So it only functions during the day, which contributes to the insecurity of the neighborhood. So here, uh, the same question, but this, this time we use the, the villa typology. And we think that the villa here, uh, since we have this problem of insecurity, uh, children and women feel that they they feel insecurity. We thought that we could come from the villa and actually transform it into the idea of a street. So the idea was to cross uh, this uh, this um, this plot entirely from one side to another, feeling uh, feeling safer than you would feel in the streets. This is the plot. It has an awkward uh, L shape. The L shape. Um, it's very narrow. As and it's see. very it narrow. It's less than nine meters, very deep. Yeah, this was, uh, I think, the main challenge was the fact that it was very, very narrow on uh, the main side of uh, the main road. It's 8.7 meters. So we could uh, rise only to 10 meters on the main road. And on the back road, we, we managed to have a little more height because the road goes down. Um, so when we applied the type that we wanted to to apply in this plot we made a street we had to break down the blocks to have natural lighting we had to make um, these voids to guarantee that we would have cross ventilations in all of the units and here we have different um, types of units we would we would make a block on the uh, on the far uh, end with the studios a space for a communal area in the bottom. We would have two bedrooms, one bedrooms, and commercial areas. For us, it was really important that this street could give access to each uh, unit. Uh, and in order to do so, it was the idea that you could cross the street and have 17 doors instead of having one building door and one uh, main stairs and then I don't know, like highway uh, uh, connections. Corridors or yeah, galleries. Mm -hmm. So the idea was really to use completely the road permanently. So this would guarantee the safety of anyone who would cross because we're talking about 17 doors, probably 17, uh, probably, uh, I don't know, uh, 10 families at least crossing the streets all day. Um, so it would guarantee that we would always have activity. And uh, once again, the... Um, the roof was used for uh, for gardening uh, as per and recreation and recreation exactly 
So here, just to understand on these three buildings on the on the left, to in order to achieve to having all this access on the ground floor, we have on the first block the four uh, two bedroom apartments that are they work in all it's it's the same in the three blocks, but it's just to really show because it's it's not uh, evident to understand through the plan. Oh, we're missing. Well, it's the same thing. It's all right. Um, so we see that the four, uh, the four units with the two bedrooms, the there are the blue, which are these vertical staircase to connect. Which exactly? Yeah. Um, there is the brown, uh, the brown typology in the middle is a one bedroom apartment. There are the bedroom one bedroom apartment. Sorry, and the four units that are supposed to work as the commercial uh, gallery in the project. Go ahead. So this is the plan. Um, that we see in the bottom, uh, the the plan, the lower, um, where we have a commercial area in the main block in the back where we have the studios. The upper floor where you go into the street uh, in the main road, you have access. Uh, we use the colors, so the blue is access to the two bedrooms, the yellow is the commercial areas, and the brown gives access to the one bedroom. So same thing here, we have the typology of the one bedroom and you're still going up the stairs to go to the two bedroom. And what was really important to understand for us is that we wanted to the street to have a maximum natural lighting and that's why we need also to create those voids. So you, you never have more than six meters without natural light. And allowed us creating those, those well, those uh, uh, courtyard inside to naturally ventilate all, the, all these area. And those are the two bedroom apartments which are in duplex, so the social area on the first floor, and the two bedroom and, and bathroom on the top floor. And we didn't talk too much about the other building, the side. Because the... they're all studios. Exactly. The less complex. Yes. So this is a, an the drawing, right? Yeah. yeah. And we use exactly also the, the colors and the same texture in a way. So this is a section where you can see uh, uh, this uh, this voids and openings, and uh, it was very important for us to work these uh, shadows and to make those apartments well possible. So this is a view from the, the bottom street, bottom so, street yeah, where, where we, we have, have the studios. Exactly, <laughs> and this is a view of the main entrance on the street, um, and you can see even the apartments the one bedroom apartment have always corner corner lights in order to maximize the natural light. The incidence of natural exactly. light. Exactly. So that we are inside the streets, it's the different courtyards corner. and patios in between. And this is from what could be the, the, the worst typology, the, the one bedroom apartment in the first floor. You want to talk about the third project? Yeah. So now we're going to Lisbon, Portugal, and uh, and to talk about this um, the school of health health uh, school of higher education for the Red Cross Portugal. It's an existing building. So, well, that's a picture that everyone knows about Lisbon when you go there. But the reality of of where is the school is uh, the Casal Ventoso. Um, it's a neighborhood unit in the city that occupies one of the slope of the Alcantara Valley. It gained promin uh, prominence in Portuguese society due to problems of delinquency, such as drug trafficking, drug consumption, and prostitution. I think most of you have no idea that, well, in this area was the biggest markets of drugs in Europe. Um, and at the end of the 90s, there are this entire process of removing completely this, uh, this area. And they, well, they, they took all the population um, to the lower valley, and building um, social housing. Well, actually, it was exactly the same here in 1999 when, well, the municipality gave to the to the Red Cross the school. So the area of uh, the Alcantara Valley, for those who know Lisbon, is in the same axis where there is this. Uh, 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 well, there is the bridge crossing the other side, right? I was at the Golden Gate, but it's uh, in Cinco de Abril. <laughs> So those are pictures of what used to be the Casal Ventos in the 80s, uh, just before they demolished it in, in the 90s. And this is today. 
where they put the entire population in the social housing. Is something? Yeah, so this is why we spoke about Casal Ventoso. This was a population that lived in this this neighborhood that was uh, very problematic. They demolished the whole neighborhood and they uh, placed them exactly where um, the uh, the project uh, is located. Yeah, you can see here the school. This is the school, yeah. So to understand the, the territory, you need to understand the topography of the Alcantara Valley. And... The, to understand that this area of the city has absolutely, well, had absolutely no interest for the city. Is those that... are the those are the views of the Alcantara Valley. And you can see that the project is absolutely in the middle of highways, railways. And roughly what what we need to understand about the Alcantara Valley is over time, the evolution from um, a more agricultural area to an industrial area to today, but, oops, okay, nice. Um, but uh, during the dictatorship, the river that ran through the valley was channeled and turned into a road uh, called the Avenida de Ceuta. This was done with the int intention of creating new access points to the city and promoting urban development. However, the channeling had severe consequences as it obstructed the natural flow of water and resulted in constant floodings in the rainy season, as you can see. Nevertheless, uh, last year, or maybe two years ago, yeah, 21, um, the city had the plan to change, to open again the river, and uh, to create this uh, new green corridor to bring back, in a way, an access uh, to the city, to the river. Um, we had the chance that actually this building had an occupancy of almost uh, 1,500 people among students and professors. So in order to intervene in an existing building, um, we I collaborate. <laughs> yeah, we've... Uh, uh, we collaborate. Your English is better. <laughs> so what we did is what we collaborated with a sociologist and made a survey that we sent to all of the students and uh, faculty of the school where we found it's quite a unique chance to actually get uh, the information uh, that we wanted. We wanted to really know what they thought of, of, of the school and the neighborhood, the urban, uh, the urban the social aspects of it so we had we had the chance to uh, to ask them that and we we actually found uh, they, they confirmed yeah they, there were some com surprising um, outcomes one of which is um, we need to understand that if we are uh, we we have a, a building that is that was built initially uh, not as a school and the school occupies it um, they occupy it um, let's say without without any logic or without knowing uh, how to occupy it and this was never done before um so we thought that they would think that a vertical school is extremely inefficient that they wouldn't like it but to our surprise uh two-thirds of the users are actually satisfied with the fact that the school is vertical um this was when the administration contacted us one of the major problems was exactly that it is vertical and they thought that nobody liked the fact that it was vertical, but no, actually they do. Um, the the thing is, it, it confirms it confirmed uh, what we thought that they feel isolated, uh, that there is a lack of alternative transportation, a lack of relation to the surroundings. There's a lack of um, interaction and in, uh, spaces for interaction and integration. Uh, the classrooms are not appropriate either. There are poor acoustics and non-functioning windows. Other than that, the natural lighting in the space was comfortable, suitable. View, yeah, and they have good views. So they were quite satisfied about that. Um, so basically what, what we have here is um, in there is the isolated aspect of this project, which to us was quite intriguing and we really needed to understand um, thoroughly what what gave it this 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 feeling of isolation. So we we uh, looked into a uh, fifteen minute radi fifteen minute ride uh, radius if they were really isolated. So we saw there were various schools, there were various culture and leisure buildings, uh, institutions. There were lots of hospitals and 
uh, we saw that very quickly they weren't really isolated. So we needed to really understand what gave this feeling. And it, I mean, once we came closer to the school, it obviously comes very clearly that they are afraid to relate to the neighborhood. They're afraid um, to, um, let's say, to, to, yeah. to interact exactly with the neighborhood. So we're talking about this very stigmatized uh, neighborhood and um, that, that was located here and they're afraid to deal and to, to relate, let's just say. Um, so I think in a, as a reflection of that, even the building in itself reflects this sort of confusing, uh, sort of dissimulated entrance. Uh, they managed to, to make it into something that nobody knows where we go in the building. That's how much they, they don't want to relate to the space. So we have uh, this podium that really does not, is an isolated podium in, in the urban realm. Where the entrance actually is in the basement rather than in ground floor. Yeah. So um, at the architectural scale, we're talking about a building that is uh, that is brutalist in its in its heritage, in its essence, um, and it is a uh, high high rise for Lisbon for Lisbon scale. Let's say for yeah, not for you guys, for, not for America's scale, but it is a high rise. Um, for Lisbon, if we look at uh, the high rise in, in Lisbon, we're talking about the highest one is 37, 37 floors It's very low for you guys, but um, for us, it is considered a, a high rise in the city. Uh, there are very, very few um, and none of them have a brut brutalist uh, sort of architecture. Um, so we looked at well, the an institution. Exactly. Exactly. And if we look into the brutalist architecture in Lisbon, even fewer, let's say we have even fewer specimens. Um, and we can see that they're very related to cultural institutions, schools, religious uh, buildings and so forth. Um, as for the characteristics of the brutalist tower, I think they're quite evident. We're talking about exposed uh, prefab, precast uh, concrete uh, um facades um where we have this modular um beautiful modular precast um uh, unit. unit sorry and um this is just showing a bit of the decay of this structure so the fact that they don't uh they don't take care of it it has been uh, deteriorating for some time uh, they have done illegal structures they've built things on top uh, they really don't take care of it, let's say. And there we go. No. Go for it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So when we start looking into details, uh, doing uh, a quick uh, diagrammatic analysis of the entire building, according to uh, specific parameters, we understand that quickly there is a disproportional occupation of space between users, um, between the students and the teachers, actually the teachers, which are roughly around 100 teachers, they occupy 35% of the tower, which is insane when you got 1,000 students. So the ratio wasn't good for us. Uh, then there is a poor use of space and corridors. There's so many corridors. We have to remember that this tower was uh, an office tower. And uh, well, inside each floor, there was uh, six, seven rooms. So that this uh, amount of space they're losing. Uh, obviously, um, an absence of accessible sanitary facilities on all the floors. Uh, the core uh, uh, is providing absolutely no alternative circulation, which for us also is a problem. Uh, there is a lack of quality of space uh, for formal alternative study areas because they're completely absent, to be honest. Um, there is an absence of dedicated spaces for socializing for both students and teachers, an absence of library, it's just a 16 square meters room, um, an absence of auditoriums, an absence of cafeteria that can cater to the students. I think it could be 30 people maximum. And uh, well, without saying about all the intervention repairs that made over time without any rigor on an overall thinking. And there is the lack of absence of uh, the use of the terrace and worsely, the absence of a coherent identity um, in the entire uh, uh, projects. As you can see, over the time, the renovation, they use different materials for the corridors uh, and for the spaces, and the external space are used for more mechanical uh, areas. 
Um, so we, when we we're contacted by uh, the Red Cross, they ask us actually, well, that was the program. We need to have three auditorium. We need to have a library, a refectory, and an academic clinic. But the problem is after we did this uh, uh, this survey that I think was 500 something that answered to the survey, we understand that actually they needed much more than what they well they thought about. So we need to optimize circulation areas. We need an area for the teachers. We need to create alternative vertical circulation. We need to have well sanitary facilities on all the floors. Accessible. We need to accessible, mm -hmm. obviously. We need to improve formal studies area, create informal study areas and collective spaces and propose better use of terrace and define a coherent identity and make the building occasionally sustainable. So looking to the existing podium, the idea, the question is also the same, how to make it work, right? Um, so we wanted to use the public podium as uh, uh, to bring the public podium and to generate uh, this interface between the uh, the outside and the school. Okay, sorry. And uh, w one of the idea was to to bring in a way vertically the podium as well, bringing the school vertically. The thing is about the podium, the podium it has the function of um, basically sorry, filtering the the public and and the private together. Uh, it has it, it usually houses the the public functions of uh, of a school of a building. So when we think about housing the public. Um, the public program of the school, we thought the informal spaces, the, info the informal uh, group areas and uh, study areas, they were also considered um, as uh, public spaces of this school. And we thought, okay, so we can maybe reorganize the whole circulation of this building, verticalizing this podium. So when we do that, our intention here is to actually create a primary circulation um, a new primary circulation in this building because we had such a strangled circulation um, with the already uh, built structure. So this is uh, the uh, building as we had, uh, the podium uh, as it is, uh, let's say today, still uh, the podium, it is entirely... Uh, private and the uh, entrance as we saw in the picture is done uh, uh, on the minus one in the minus one so you have to go down to go in um, what we wanted is to uh, really bring a, a proper entrance to the school and uh, so so to do so what we did was we elevated uh, the entrance of, of the we elevated the public space and elevated the entrance to uh, give this a proper uh, entrance. The second step was to actually make this podium into something uh, rich, large, which could house uh, the public program of of the school. So that could house all of all of the um, the libraries and auditoriums and so forth. After that, we thought that um, it was essential to create an, at an atrium, uh, which is something the school never had, um, to organize, to primarily organize the, uh, the program around, around the podium. Um, this is, uh, once the podium was, was created, uh, there, there was uh, the first time um, the, the school actually, sorry, yeah, the, the first time the school actually invited uh, the community inside the inside the building was when they asked us to make, to create a, a clinic where they would treat the community, the local community. So in order to separate these two accesses, we did the clinics on the, on the main road and the entrance to the school on the side. So it could be visible to everyone. Yeah. Um, so we have we added a block for more uh, because it has more capacity. Once we we added the circulation block, it allowed to uh, have more classrooms, um, and so we added in the front and in the top of 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 the building we added the administration and the professors. This is the final building, and here's an image of the project. 
So um, here we just placed one uh, right beside the other, the uh, the old plan and the project plan uh, on the right side. You can see that it's, it is considerably larger. Here we're talking about the entrance on the right. So we have the atrium and we would have the auditoriums, administrative and uh, library um, on the ground floor, which we didn't have before. Here are some in images of the entrance, the atrium and the library on the ground floor. Um, here, uh, when we created the atrium, uh, our idea was to um, have natural lighting and that natural ventilation uh, as much as possible. So what we did here was we created elevated an elevated garden, a suspended garden that would create a buffer between uh, what would then become uh, the, uh, ref the refractory and uh, the atrium. And we could have the natural lighting and ventilation. Sorry. And, existing tower, yeah. uh, and this way, we also uh, have a buffer between the existing architecture and the new architecture as well. So this would be the plan of the refectory. So now it takes up the whole floor, which it didn't before. An image on the left of the refectory, an image uh, of the auditorium and the atrium. Just uh, this is the minus one. So where we have the public clinic that would come for the community uh, in the bottom floor and the gymnasiums of the school. Um, yeah, so basically this is uh, our um, project which proposes to have a public uh, podium versus the private old podium. This is just the images of the uh, clinic for the community. And here, uh, once again, we have uh, the issue of the water. Uh, it's a very pressing issue in this building today. Uh, the two garage floors, in uh, they fill up entirely with water when it rains. So basically here, what we propose is to have a, um, a deposit for this water, uh, pump it up to a water mirror. And this way we can also get water from this from the rain, right? Treat this water and use it in the building. Apparently, we were not sure entirely of how much water we're dealing with because apparently it's a lot of water. Uh, so we've been talking to the municipality of the, op of the possibility of treating this water and actually using it in the community. So this is like a type floor uh, with the, the classrooms, the new classrooms, and uh, let's say the vertical circulation, uh, the vertical podium, yeah. And yeah, and the, yeah. So the terraces and the classrooms, they would become, the terraces would become uh, places for, uh, I don't know, workshop. Uh, they would become places for class, uh, so leisure. classrooms, um, physical therapy, physical therapy, yoga classes, and so forth. Plan. And this is just uh, a few images of the vertical podium. So basically the extension of this public area of the podium that we verticalized to create a primary circulation space where we would have informal uh, areas of studying, uh, group, individual, and so forth. There are various types of, of, of places, of communal spaces. These are just sections of the building. And this is just images of the uh, professor's lounges and terraces and the administration uh, of the administration. Yeah, there we go. So um, basically here, uh, just to finish the, the, um, this, uh, the presentation and the project, our strategy here, we know that uh, architecture here, it goes up to a certain point. Uh, there is no way <laughs> we think that we can tackle the issue of this neighborhood with uh, architecture or typo typology alone. So what we've been doing is we've been working and talking to the municipality about the possibility of actually coming from the inside out because we're talking about the Red Cross as an institution. So I think there's a great opportunity here to actually expand. They have an issue uh, with areas, so they need to create more clinics to to uh, prof uh, professionalize their students and the people who uh, who are in the school. And these this community needs to be treated. So what we are proposing is this community, it has very little commerce today, uh, very little shops, very little restaurants and markets because there isn't public to consume. So there isn't, they're, they're not there. Um, 
to to actually you they they all they open and they break down um so they 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 declare bankruptcy um so the idea here is since it is the red cross we were we have been speaking to the municipality of the possibility of start to start to occupy this uh, slowly the the neighborhoods and this would obviously make them start to real well uh, circulate in the neighborhood that's a that's already a start and then to to actually uh, have a relationship with these people and uh, as a yeah taking the school outside and with uh, we we are in the hope that this will be enough to um to activate this neighborhoods and to bring life to it. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you guys. Uh, hopefully we still have time for questions from the audience. If there's any questions, any student questions. Okay, coming up. Uh, earlier on, you mentioned how working in a bunch of different countries afforded you unique insights. Could you elaborate on that? Um, well, um, I think what we have to understand, right, as an architect, is um, architecture, I th it's the last moment when you plan your project. Uh, you need to absolutely understand all the diagrams that we've been talking. The geopolitical decision we influenced uh, uh, the the policy making and the socio economic pressures, right? And the decision that we'll have on the territory and how it will be applied in urbanism and architecture. And uh, when you start actually understanding all those steps and all those uh, diagrams, I think we could well at the end you could operate. In a more uh, conscious, consciousness, mm -hmm. yeah, more consciousness, and um, and challenge really uh, the neighborhood, and um, you know the well, yeah, what's super interesting that the fact that we have the chance to um, get to know different country, different perspective, different approach, uh, but at the end, doing housing is absolutely the same in all the countries. It's about dignity. And uh, yeah, generates uh, a space where people can um, feel comfortable. I don't know if it sounds so. You want to add something? No, I I'm not sure. Did, sorry, did you mean in the in the project perspective or in the office perspective? Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. No, but the the well, I'll give you the the office perspective is actually really interesting because. Because then we we really have like different different opinions and different experiences uh, that actually come from their uh, how do you say these things yeah. that come from their uh, life experience right uh, different cultures um, in our office we we really are from from different cultures and different places of the world and and to be honest it 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 always adds to 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 the project these these are really interesting experiences I I would definitely recommend it. Hello, um, <clears throat> my name is Vash Andrade. I'm also from Portugal. It's really nice to, to see you guys. Um, I was just wondering um, why you decided to get involved with a project in Sao Paulo. Okay. Well, this particularly, this project particularly, we were invited into a private competition. So this is why we were involved. We, we've been... Uh, uh, we, we have an office in Brasilia, which is not exactly uh, Sao Paulo, uh, at least for now. Um, but um, we we are absolutely, we're kind of aficionados with uh, Sao Paulo. It's quite an interesting, uh, very interesting, vivid city. Uh, but yeah, we, we were invited to this competition. So this is why we, we got involved. And to be honest, the challenge of the, uh... Social housing is super stimulating. To be honest, when you get to 
I think it might answer also to, to the question is just asked. But the fact that you're not from there and you get there and you discover different realities and at the end, at the end game is the same, you know, which is insane. But uh, uh, the entire process to get there, you observe so many different things. And I think it's always challenging and I'm not sure for you guys, but uh, I think even for students in university, most of the time you study about social housing, right? About bringing the dignity and uh, and you know, having a house is just a human condition. It's the minimum that we 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 need, and we have the obligation in a way to do to do it right to try at least to give this dignity to the people to feel comfortable. Right? So yeah, it's challenging. That the. the I'm struck by that the term you've used many times, the dignity. Yeah. So uh, is this, I was, I was wondering, is this just a casual, you know, word that he's using or is this, is it loaded as something that you really think about? And I was I'd like to hear more about it. Well, you know, Henri Zilleux said that uh, we could kill, kill someone with housing, right? And I think more than ever today and after COVID, I think, uh, today, the, the, the real disease, uh, um, it's a psych psychological one, right? And um, I, what surprised me about this question of dignity is something that every time we do housing, we try to, we as architects, we try to imagine how the population should live most of the time. And um, and the result, as we experience uh, uh, through time, is not what people want to see. But what was amazing in the case of Brazil, uh, in the, this competition in Sao Paulo, right? And we were able to talk to the community and the fact that you see those conditions, those pictures of the reality that we show you to us. I was expecting for people to be, not, I would not say shame, but in a way fragile with, with their houses. But no, they were proud proud of us. They were very and, proud. Uh, and it reminds us that every time we think and we project about housing, specifically on the social housing um, and communal housing, we really need to understand those feelings. It's not about us projecting what we think is uh, the ideal uh, housing, but the influence about each region, uh, uh, each, uh, uh, well, we need to understand this uh, social heritage, right, to be able to answer. So yes, the, this question of dignity is, uh, is really absolutely uh, of the utmost importance for us. Um, and because, uh, yeah, I've been, after being a couple of years traveling and doing projects in different countries, you can see that even though you try to answer to this population, I was like, I was answering uh, previously. The answer at the end is always the same. If you do something where the person at the end feels happy and feels that his house is, is something, it's, it's very personal. Yeah. So yeah, dignity is, uh, is, is important. <laughs> Sorry. Maybe we have time for one last question. Hi. So um, what are a couple of different examples you've encountered in different approaches taken from um, people coming from in from the office in Lisbon or the people coming from the office in Brasilia? Or additionally, what are some different design approaches you have to take depending on which country or which city you're designing in? Chaos. Confusion. This is amazing, to be honest. Right. I, I think... I think this is something that I really like in Miami, to be honest. Um, I've been here for four days, but this this different nationalities, okay, uh, these different backgrounds, uh, uh, speaking Spanish and English. I think it, this is amazing. This is a conflict. This is an internal conflict. And the at the office, it, it's exactly that. I don't want some someone to think like us and to just say yes. I want someone to say, oh, this is a dumb idea. You're stupid. You know, start challenging me because. Uh, um, we all have different stories. And if we add each other to our stories, I think we can generate a really interesting architecture. And for me, at the end, I know people will hate to, well, to, to listen to that, but I resume what we do as emotion. If you look at architecture and there is absolutely no emotion behind it, to be honest, for me, there's absolutely no point to do it. Um, so I don't want to be indifferent. I want to be challenged. It could be beautiful. It could be super ugly, and that's the case. I've been we've been around here in the city. There is ugly stuff, and there is interesting stuff and beautiful stuff. And but I want to feel, and I think at the end, uh, that's the most important for us. And the fact that we 
uh, when you come at the office and we have different nationalities and the fact that we almost schizophrenia because we we work in different time schedule we we are in different projects. I think like every architect doing project all around the world and I think this is beautiful okay this chaos and challenge I don't know if it was a bit romantic but that's the the overall idea <laughs> okay so yeah if you think differently and if you want to challenge it yeah speak it's good it's exciting all right awesome thank you guys we'll end on chaos is beautiful i appreciate your beautiful presentation thank you guys for your time thank you.